I'm Dr. Katina Robison, and this is Dr. Lindsay Beffa. We're gynecologic oncologists, and today we're going to review thermoablation and how to use the YSAP device. The purpose of this video is to learn how and when to use the thermoablation device. This video should not be used in lieu of in-person training on cervical cancer screening and treatment. Thermocoagulators, also known as cold coagulators or thermoablation devices, are used to treat precancerous lesions of the cervix. Appropriate lesions for treatment with thermoablation include lesions that are seen completely on the cervical face and do not extend into the cervical canal, there are no cervical polyps, the patient does not have cervicitis, as well as only being used to treat low-grade lesions, meaning there is no concern for a high-grade lesion or high-grade dysplasia or cancer, and the lesion should not encompass more than 75% of the cervical face. In this video, you learn how to use this thermal ablation device, and you'll also learn the parts, how to assemble them, how to clean, and also some tips and tricks. Now we're gonna review all the parts inside the carrying case, as well as how to assemble the device. First, you're gonna have the instruction manual, which you should review prior to putting the device together. So here is the handle. This is the slider, which is gonna go over the thermo probe as a protector. And then over here, you have a number of different types of power cords. There are gonna be adapters, which you can use in all of the device, depending on the country. There's a portable battery, and this battery is going to need to be attached to the handle at all times to make sure that it is powered, and it's also going to be described a little bit later so that we show you how to read it. And then we have four different power ports. So the YSAP thermal ablation device comes with a rechargeable battery. In order to charge the battery, you have a couple of different options. You can use the device that plugs in directly into the wall with different adapters, depending on the country that you're in. This would then go directly into the wall. You would charge the battery by plugging this into the battery bank. An alternative, if you don't have a source of energy through the wall, is to actually use a portable energy source, such as a portable generator, and you would again charge the battery by plugging this in directly into the battery bank. When you first get the battery, it may have no charge. In order to determine how much charge there is in the battery bank, you're first gonna use the power button to turn on the battery bank. Press down and hold, and the blue LED light will illuminate. This will then show you the percentage of charge remaining. As you can see, this has 0%, and thus we will need to charge it before using. If your battery does not have charge, you then can use the wall outlet. In order to put this power cord together, you have this power brick. The gray end of the cord goes directly into the handle. This you want to line up until it fits. Sometimes that requires you turning in different directions and you'll hear a snap. Next, the portion that goes directly into the wall the other end of that cord has a two-pronged end that plugs directly into the power brick. Again, you'll hear a snap. Now, this can be plugged directly into the wall in order to power your device. Similarly, if you want to use the battery power bank, you're going to get the cord that has the gray end. Again, the gray end plugs directly into the handle. You're going to put it in. You may have to spin it in order to hear a click. This end then plugs directly into your power bank on your battery. The blue LED light will illuminate and you're ready to go if it is charged. It's important when charging the portable battery that you look first and you see that it's 
And when you plug it in to the outlet, you should see a lightning bolt appear and that tells you that it's charging. So if you don't see the lightning bolt appear, remove the device from the outlet. It's important to push down to take off the brick and try again to reseat the brick and then try either a different outlet or the same outlet and look for that lightning bolt. As you can see here, it's charging. So here we're gonna review how to put the handle and the probe together. You have your handle. Here you can see the gray arrow is going to line up with the gray arrow on the probe. You're gonna push it and then turn it. Again, follow the arrow until it locks into place and will not turn any further. You can also see that the arrow now lines up with this groove in the probe. You wanna put on your slider. To do that, you're gonna put the probe tip through the end of the slider and snap the white piece on. And now your handle is together. Now we're gonna demonstrate how to use a thermocoagulator on an actual patient. We're gonna use this model. It's really important before you do the procedure with the patient that you first obtain consent from the patient and then let the patient know that there are some side effects that they may experience after the procedure, such as some mild pain can be very normal, watery discharge, or even a little bit of bleeding or spotting. Once you ask for informed consent, then you're gonna go on to the procedure. Now remember, you wanna make sure that your battery is turned on and has sufficient charge. Then you'll want to plug the battery in to your device and you will know that it's plugged in by the green light. Remember, in order to start the heating, first make sure that the slider is moved up covering the probe and then you will push the heating button. But before you start the heating, you'll wanna go ahead and insert the speculum. Make sure that you have gloves on, let the patient know that you're gonna start the procedure. So we will insert a speculum and find the cervix and make sure that we see a lesion and that we have good visualization and feel like the procedure is able to be performed. Now we'll start the heating process. When the heating process is started, we'll see a green light as well as the LED lights will be illuminated. During this process, it is again important to make sure that the slider is all the way covering the probe as the probe will start to be warm. Now that you see the green button is no longer flashing, it is time to insert with the slider forward the entire probe in and on the cervix. Now you wanna be covering the lesion and you'll start the timer. Pull the slider back. Make sure that you're all the way against the cervix. And now we'll wait, watching the blue light. We will hear two beeps. And then the third time we'll hear a double beep and the blue light will go off. And that will notify us that the procedure is complete. Now that the timer is off, move the slider forward to protect the vaginal walls as we remove the probe from the patient. Turn the heating off, place this down, and remove your speculum. It's really important when you're use, learning to use the thermocoagulator that you practice. You can use any type of meat. We have chicken here today, and we're gonna show you how it actually coagulates the tissue. First, remember, check your battery and make sure that you still have battery life. We have 99%. We also have the battery on and we see a green light showing that the device is on. We're now going to put it into heating mode. You can see there's two ways to tell that the heating mode is on, the blinking green light 
as well as the LED lights are illuminating. Once this blinking green light stops, then it is heated, the probe is heated and ready to be used. During this process, it's important to remember that we have the protective slider covering the probe so that you don't burn anything. So now we have the green light ready. You can insert into the patient as we just did, and then you will wanna press the timer. Once the timer is pressed, bring back the protective probe and then press firmly against the tissue. You hold it there and the blue light will continue to blink as this timer is going. And as you can see on the chicken, there's an area here that has been ablated. Remember to slide the protective slider again, bring it out of the patient. You can see by the LED lights, the heating is still on. Turn the heating off. And now the device is safe to take apart and disinfect. Now we're gonna go through the cleaning and disinfection process. This process is important to keep the device functioning properly, to prevent any unnecessary wear and tear on the device, but most importantly, to prevent any disease transmission between patients. If the cleaning and disinfection process is not done appropriately between every patient, there is the possibility of transmitting certain infections such as HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C between patients. It's important for the cleaning and disinfection process that you have all the appropriate materials before you start the process of cleaning and performing these procedures. So first, as a reminder, always have gloves. As you do the cleaning, it's very important to make sure you're using gloves yourself so that you protect your hands. We also want some type of disinfectant wipe or some cloth that you can do a wipe down of all of the different items prior to going through. Then you're going to want a soft medical brush of some type. You must use something soft that will not damage the probe tip. Now it's important if you can use sterile water or boiled water. However, if those are not available, it's okay to use whatever water you have available for both rinses. The first thing you'll wanna do is disinfect the speculum. Whether they're reusable and you're using them again or whether they're metal, you always wanna disinfect these. You wanna take them apart and then in the rinsing bucket, you're gonna take your brush and you're gonna remove any debris on both pieces of this speculum. Then you're gonna rinse it off and you're gonna put these in your glutaraldehyde solution. You're gonna let them sit in the glutaraldehyde solution for 30 minutes. Once 30 minutes has gone by, you're gonna take them out of this solution and then you're going to thoroughly rinse them, again, in sterile water if available or boiled water. After rinsing, you'll take it out and then you want to leave them and allow them to completely dry before using them. Next, we're gonna disassemble the unit. We've already removed it from any power source. We are going to remove the protective sheath as well as the probe. Next, the handle that cannot be submerged, we are going to wipe down with a disinfectant cloth. There are five basic steps to the high level disinfection of the probes, wipe and rinse, short soak, rinse, dry and inspect, long soak, and then the final wash and dry. The first step is to prepare the probes for washing and disinfection. Disconnect the units from the handle and wash them with a soft medical brush under clean water to make sure that they are free from any visible contamination or adhering tissue. You must use a very soft brush for this step, otherwise there is a risk of damaging the probe tip. Please be aware that the next steps in cleaning and disinfection can only be completed when there is no visible contamination or adhering tissue on the surface. The second step is a short soak of five minutes in a high level disinfectant. Fill a container with cytosine solution at least three centimeters deep. 
Place the washed probes into the cytosine, ensuring that the probes are completely submerged and that no air bubbles are sticking to the surface of the probes and that the disinfecting solution covers every single surface of the probe. Leave the units immersed in the cytosine bath for five minutes. If other solutions are used, please follow the instructions from their manufacturers. The third step will be to rinse, dry, and inspect the probes. After the successful cleaning, wash the units under clean water shortly, then dry them with a clean paper or cloth and inspect them again to confirm that there's no more visible contamination. The fourth step is a long soak in a high-level disinfectant. Prepare a container with Cydex OPA HLD solution at least three centimeters deep. Ensure that all the information of the disinfection process prescribed by the manufacturer of the disinfectant used is observed. Place the dried units in the disinfecting solution and ensure that the entire probes are submerged and completely enclosed. Ensure that no air bubbles stick to the probe surface and that the disinfecting solution covers all surfaces. Leave the units immersed in the high-level disinfectant bath for at least 15 minutes. If other disinfecting solutions are used, follow the instructions of the manufacturers. The fifth step is a final wash and dry. Remove the probes from the disinfectant bath and place them in a third container. Pour sterile water or water that has been boiled and cooled in order to clean it on top of the probes until the entire units are submerged. Leave the units in this water bath for one minute. Remove the units from the bath and dry them in a disinfected environment with a clean cloth. Pay particular attention that the plug at the end of the probe is dry.